professor of civil and environmental engineering at Northwestern University and director of the Executive Management for Design and Construction or EMDC program. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this event this afternoon. I want to thank each of you for joining in the first of a series of periodic panel discussions that we plan to organize as part of our effort in the MDC program to share with our professional colleagues some of the current thinking about major problems facing the AEC industry in these trying times. As all of you are aware, the world in general, and our profession in particular, has never experienced anything quite like this epidemic in our lifetimes. And it will certainly be beneficial for everyone to learn how some of the, of the profession's most successful individuals view the situation and their thoughts on how to cope with it. While we clearly do not promise any definite solutions to the problems faced, our achievable goal this afternoon is to provide some very meaningful food for thought to help place the situation in perspective. And now I'd like to share with you in the next few minutes, uh, a bit of information about the EMDC program. In brief, the EMDC program is an online graduate study program aimed at individuals who are aspiring young executives with eight to 10 or more years of progressive experience, and that's an important term, uh, and are motivated to move into the C-suite. It is taught exclusively by successful professionals with typically 20 or more years and some with 30 or 40 years of professional experience. And this is a secret to its success, as evidenced by both formal evaluations and a multitude of unsolicited, very favorable comments from graduates. The course materials transcend the tactical issues, such as estimating and scheduling and so forth, typically addressed by project managers, and emphasizes the strategic competencies and insights needed to lead an organization. The courses address much of the material included in any typical MBA degree, but from the perspective of its application to design and construction problems and challenges. The program is offered by the engineering school and leads to an MS degree, but we often refer to it as an MBA degree for engineers and architects, because in a very real sense, that's what it is. And in fact, many of our faculty teaching the program have themselves completed an MBA degree in years past, before the development of this program. How much time does it take? Individuals pursuing the program typically take two courses per quarter, where each course meets once a week for 10 weeks. And each class requires participation in an interactive webinar from 6.30 to 8 o'clock central time, one day per week, plus viewing an hour or so video prior to the class at a time of convenience. In addition, there's the homework time, which is normally on the order of hours, not tens of hours, on the order of hours, and is highly dependent on the background and specific interest of the individual. Now, where are you coming from? Where do you wanna to go to? How interested are you in the subject and so forth? This schedule allows completion of the degree in two academic years or 18 months with no classes during the summer. And now enough about explaining the MDC program. Additional information is available on the website. Let's move on to the highlight of the meeting today, the panel discussion with our cast of C-suite executives and leaders in the design, construction, consulting, and finance industry. To introduce our panelists and moderate the proceedings, I am most pleased to pass the baton to Karen Lane, who just happens to be one of our faculty and really the person who did most of the lion's share of the work in putting together this group. Karen. The ball is in your court. Thank you so much, Ray. Uh, welcome to everyone to our first ever uh, Northwestern EMDC current events webinar. 
We are thrilled to see the incredible reception for this program and that numerous of our program alumni, students, faculty, and aspiring and interested applicants have joined us today. After today's session, we will ask you to complete a short, a short survey to tell us if we met your business expectations today and if there are other potential future topics of interest to you. Before I introduce our esteemed panel of industry experts, I have a few housekeeping logistics, however. First, we will hand the chat open so that you may all submit questions to the organizers and I will gather and group them and pose them to the panel at the conclusion of our planned remarks. This way they won't be open to the full group and not to distract. Secondly, as you probably can see, we're taping this program and we'll post it to the Northwestern EMDC social media sites and ask that you hopefully will consider sharing them with your contacts as well. Now on to our experts. It would literally take the entirety of today's program for me to list all the accolades, awards, and significant impacts that this collective group has had on our AEC industry. We've shared their LinkedIn profiles with the marketing materials, and I will best thus today just briefly introduce each of them. Now, pre-COVID, I would have started with the speaker to my left but I don't know where each gentleman is on your Zoom windows, so today I'll do them in alpha order. We'll start with Justin Brown. Justin Brown is the CEO and president of Skender Construction Company. Since joining Skender in 2005, Justin has led the company-wide strategic growth initiatives. He's helped to expand the market sector expertise and annual revenues, as well as worked across all business functions to create sustainable value for the firm and its clients. Since his arrival, and I must say, I've known Justin since the beginning of his arrival, and his impact was expected to be meteoric, and it has been. Um, he's grown the company into one of the nation's largest construction firms and has annual revenues exceeding $450 million. What Justin does, though, when he's not getting paid for it, he also helps drive forward the successful delivery, not, of not only of strategic programs and business growth, but serves as an active member of the HFS Chicago Scholars and the Chicago Commercial Real Estate Board of Directors. And he's on Skender's Foundation, a 501c3 charitable organization focused on strengthening communities through funding, volunteering, and partnering. Justin, thank you for agreeing to participate today. Our next panelist is Christian Berger, the CEO of Berger Consulting. Christian is the principal of Berger Consulting Group, or BCG, established in 1994 as an independent consulting firm based in the Chicago area that concentrates exclusively on IT strategy and tactics for the construction industry. Christian is a frequent speaker at these industry events. He contributes articles on technology and the construction industry to numerous industry publications. He teaches technology courses for Northwestern University McCormick's School, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in the MPM and the EMDC programs, which we're featuring today. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting from Ball State and a Master of Arts from Northwestern University. Thank you, Christian, for bringing your expertise today to the program. Our next speaker is Christopher Burke, and he's the founder and CEO of Christopher Burke Engineering. Christopher Burke has been the chief executive officer and president of the company founded from 1986 to 2020. And prior to that was also with Harza Environmental Services as a senior urban hydrologist and environmental engineer. There are so many awards that Christopher <laughs> Burke um, has won that we'll just list several on this slide so you can see the most recent. Um, these include not only the um, ASCII Civil Engineer of the Year Award in 2009, but two Lifetime Achievement Awards, one from the Illinois Association for Floodplain and Stormwater Management, and the President's Lifetime Award from Purdue University's Engineering Alumni Association. Chris, thank you for joining us today, your exceptional contributions to this industry. Our last but not least speaker is Bob Frenzel. 
the president and managing director, Specialized Industries of CIBC Bank. Bob is the president and managing director and has been since 2017, June. But he's been a leader in the construction industry for a quarter of a century. Previously, he had an executive role as the vice president and managing director of the private bank for 13 years. And even before that, and when I think I first met Bob, back at LaSalle Bank, uh, when he was the group's senior vice president um, for over 11 years. Uh, Bob is a Northwestern University Kellogg School of Management uh, graduate, and he also has not only his MBA um, in finance and marketing from uh, Miami University, he's got his Bachelor of Science and Business Administration. So lastly, um, I will be moderating this esteemed panel and appreciate all of them uh, for joining us today. Uh, I'm the current president and founder of my own firm, Mateco, uh, which just focuses on business and legal uh, strategy and board governance and internal investigation. Uh, prior to that, uh, was uh, chief strategy of a national mechanical and industrial process piping firm and was in big law with better price for uh, two and a half decades. But now that you've met our panel, we want to get to the press pressing issues of today that Ray teed up earlier. And the first we're going to start is related to COVID matters, as Ray talked about the pandemic. So I'd like the panel to focus, and I'm going to turn it over to Bob first, that given a number of these global factors from the pandemic, we know that corresponding and already existing labor shortages existed, we had climate concerns, cyber sabotage, schedules on large projects have thus been and continue to be compressed resulting construction delays and force majeure and other demands on these projects are creating considerable issues in the industry. We see from the legal side that claims between engineers, contractors, owners, and ENO insurance carriers continue to mount. So Bob first, can I turn this over to you and ask you what challenges has the construction industry been faced with these first months of the pandemic? How are they different from past economic downturns how are projects being affected, and what's the impact different across different types in this industry? Thanks, Karen. And, and Ray, I, I want to thank both of you for uh, putting together this program. I, I can't think of a better time to start putting sort of practical ac application and sort of looking at prior uh, experiences that many professionals will see to figure out how we can continue to train, nurture, and, and build our future leaders. So for this EMDC program, I'm really excited to be able to participate. And uh, I never thought that in alphabetical order that F would become last, but I guess to be an engineer, you have to have your last name to be. Nonetheless, um, you know, as we think about the challenges of COVID uh, or any economic crisis that we've seen in the past, this one's a little bit differently, a little different, and, and then it's very, very similar in, in prior. What's different is in this scenario, other than the Great Recession, access to capital is flourishing. You know, before getting project financing and getting capital was, was very constrained. Thus far, there's still access to capital. This, this recession that we're seeing obviously is driven by a worldwide pandemic. It's not as a result of financial issues and the, the quality of sort of the a counterparty risk where you're, you're not, you, you feel uncomfortable lending to somebody because they can't pay you back. Or you're, you're afraid to give to an, another financial institution because you don't know if they're solvent. So you, you don't have a Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns standpoint. So from the construction side, the, the element of liquidity and access to capital is strong. So that, that, that's consistent. The other thing that, that's, cons or that's different than what we've seen in the past. What's consistent though, is that in the vast majority of the construction industry, it takes about 12 to 18 months before the real impact of the recession hits. So as Karen mentioned, I oversee a specialized industry group, one of which is construction engineering clients. That's architects, that's engineers, material suppliers, general contractor, trade contractors, and then suppliers. Probably about 250 clients uh, ranging in revenues from 10 billion to 25 million. So a very good cross section across the nation. The vast majority of them are fine. 
Uh, they have, many of them have, have accessed the PPP programs, which has provided them much needed liquidity, which has enabled them to continue to have their workforce. So, so if you look at their backlogs, relative to where we are in the economy in the second quarter, their backlogs are still pretty good. But what's going what's to gonna happen to a contractor, engineers, architects is going to be in the next couple quarters, not right now. So the delay is, how do you anticipate 2021-22 when that is going to be the biggest challenge for them? And the biggest concern is, how do you retain labor in this marketplace, but also reduce costs because you're, you're probably not going to have the same revenue uh, to, to run your business. So in, in general, uh, I'd say it, it's too early to tell to see the true impact in the construction industry, but it's consistent with the cycle relative to that we're going to lag. And it's, it's actually better in the sense that the Fed and the banking system remains, the Fed being very active in creating liquidity and the banking system re remaining strong to help finance solid projects with, with good uh, capitalization and, and very good um, contractors and engineers. So Bob, thank you for that insight. Um, Chris, can you tell us what your thoughts are about the impact of COVID on the um, AEC industry? Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, my perspective will be this perspective of what we're seeing in Illinois and Indiana. We've got about 420 some odd people that were deployed back to their homes or if they were deemed essential workers uh, working in the field. There are winners and there's losers as in a uh, downturn. I'm going to concentrate on what we are seeing as the winners, those that seem to be coming out of this uh, much more active than they were uh, a year ago. And ironically, the ones that were the biggest losers in 2008 and the big recession. So we're seeing a big jump in industrial uh, manufacturing, warehousing, uh, one of our largest, um, and he's a mid-sized industrial uh, uh, developer, um, has already stated that their backlog will extend all the way to the end of 2021 and into 2022, just with things they have on the books today. And I think they're very similar to others that uh, are building uh, Things for people like Amazon. Um, and, and remember, Amazon wasn't around in 2008. And if they weren't around today, I don't know what we would be doing uh, as uh, um, uh, in our lives, getting things through the uh, mail. Um, home building, which was the big, big loser in the Great Recession. Um, we're seeing a resurgence. Uh, I went around to the different presidents of the companies in the group. And uh, one of them uh, identified that just this year, this week, 27 new starts on home sites. And uh, um, for the first time, I've heard these words in many years, a brand new subdivision, 400 some odd units in the suburbs. So the winners are the suburbs, the trades that are working out there, um, the people that, uh, the painters, the electricians, the plumbers. So that's a, a good uh, a piece of news. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the opposite. Um, those were the ones hurt the most during the last resurgence, uh, the recession. Um, we're also seeing a more of a neutral, Bob said it well, um, very neutral in uh, earth moving, uh, road building, underground construction. Uh, we see people that uh, are going through backlog, um, whether or not the communities will be releasing projects. Uh, over the upcoming winter has to be determined if they're relying on sales tax, uh, auto uh, uh, sales tax, um, and those things, they will be holding on to it. Um, the, challengers, uh, the challenges of my competitors, we're uh, asked around to see what they're doing. Uh, people still are not downtown. When they are going back town, they're downtown, they're dealing with the issues of how do you separate out the cubes that are tightly packed, um, the mundane aspects of how do you accommodate uh, um, you know, people that are trying to get on an elevator um, on the 30th floor and are spending an hour plus waiting in line. Those are the, th in addition, the overwhelming issue that we're seeing in the industry is how do you get your people downtown um, safely 
when they're uh, uh, predisposed to not taking a car. So um, we're also seeing uh, um, friends and family being impacted. Um, uh, anecdotally, the largest, one of the largest contractors in Northeastern Illinois um, uh, lost uh, allegedly $500 million worth of backlog and uh, um, has started uh, on a, uh, um, a major uh, reconsolidation. So those are the major things that we're seeing impacting, Karen, the uh, uh, engineering and design groups. Well, thank you, Chris, and I appreciate it. When the panel was putting together this program, we wanted to make certain that we had some positive comments to share with all of you as well. Uh, and Chris uh, highlighted some of those, so thank you. Um, so Christian, what's your take on all of this? Give us what you think from the technology side. Well, thank you, Karen, and, and thanks for the opportunity to, to participate in such an esteemed panel. And certainly like uh, to, to support the EMDC program, which I've been teaching for a, a number of years now. Um, with Ray and his his uh, his uh, group of, of uh, other instructors, um, so it has been a uh, an amazing period of time, and I've been uh, very trying to stay very in touch with our clients and and um, people uh, former clients, current clients on on how they're viewing things, what their long term view is, and I have to say that that you know if I'm if I'm only concentrating on what I'm hearing from clients, particularly, um, I would agree with Chris's comments. I mean, we're not hearing a lot of negative. Um, now, our clients aren't building in retail very much, so that would be an area we would have heard of downturn. Um, and I would say that they are, um, you know, the the road builder guys and the the civil guys, the the uh, general building guys, even the specialty trades seem to be fairly confident, good backlogs, and so forth. Um, what's been interesting, though, is what will the effect of this, of COVID, and the economic impact be on the construction industry? Um, we, as an industry, we were um, riding high on a very a tr a tremendous economic boom, a lot of construction. We, have a, we had a labor shortage problem that we still have, but uh, of skilled trades. There was, but there was a tremendous amount of inertia, I thought, in the industry as it related to moving to technology. You know, McKinsey rates our industry as, as um, not dead last, but second to last in terms of technology adoption. And, and I, I've, I've worked in this industry for 30 years, and I have to say I, I wouldn't disagree. Um, so, so with all of that economic uh, momentum, I would say the industry would dabble in technology, would embrace some of it, but wasn't moving at the pace that they needed to. And I think that the COVID situation, the, the fear of the economic challenge, the work from home is going to actually accelerate our movement into technology. It's going to uh, uh, get us less comfortable with where we were and perhaps push us forward into a more, um, more uh, automated, uh, techno technologically advanced um, uh, industry. We're not going to zoom from second to last up to, to the first because there's other there are other constraints that we have in the industry and I'll talk about some of those later that are preventing us from making that that move too quickly. I also think that it's going to it's going to accelerate some of the things we were doing already. For example, there was already a fairly substantial move to prefabrication and modular building and uh, I think that the health and safety aspect, which were beneficial before, are now really prominent as a, a, an alternative mechanism. Um, there's a lot more emphasis on HR and safety related uh, automation going on uh, and, and collaborative solutions that let people work on projects collaboratively, project managers, project engineers, is going to be a, uh, another um, a positive thing that I, I think comes out of this. Um, so I feel, so I would say that while I, it, it pains me to watch the industry and the, and the country in such a, a bad way, I'm optimistic about the, where we come out of this and the changes that it will force, I think. Well, thank you, Christian. Um, since you've given us the nod to some of the prefab and other um, matters and changing in terms of the industry focus, 
I'd like to turn to Justin and all. Justin, although you were um, introduced first, you have to go last here, but uh, we all want to hear you tie this up with a big bow and tell us what builders are doing and what you're facing uh, based on COVID, the industry. Got it. Well, Karen and Ray, thank you for having me today. I'm uh, excited to be here amongst some strange times, but I do think there's a lot of great opportunities and silver lining in all this. Um, you know, I, I would echo everybody else's comments on the, the, the economy and where we're at. You know, it was a strong economy coming into this, and we had the strongest backlog we've ever had, and we continue to do so. But we're, we're burning through it at a good rate. We're not replacing the work. That's not that because the money's not there or people don't know. Um, it's just figuring out when, on the other side of COVID, how things look and, and how, um, how the world works again where they work, where they live, how they have fun, how they get health care. And I think things have changed. So people are kind of waiting to see what happens in each one of those markets, if you will, for us to figure out how they're going to spend their money and how they're going to spend their resources um, building new projects. So it's been, it's been a little bit of a slow. Our, our, our uh, road in front of us as, as a general contractor is going to be tough in the next 18 months, I'm going to guess, until this economy gets spooled back up. Um, but there's an opportunity to reset some um, different metrics internally and externally and uh, move forward. So as far as the prefabrication and, and, and modular construction goes, you know, our sister company, Skinner Manufacturing, is obviously on the forefront of that. And uh, there's a lot of great opportunities, even more so now as far as from a COVID standpoint, um, beating construction schedules, which is time to money, speed to market. Um, specifically on the west and the east coast where the construction costs are extremely high and the the labor pool is very very challenged so so justin those comments uh, have rung true with many of my clients in terms of burning through pipeline and trying to see what it's going to look at, like on the other side so if we can advance to the next slide i'm going to go back to bob and ask about moving forward what really can builders do to come out of COVID-19 stronger? And, and what will the construction industry look like on the other side of this? Uh, you're all going to put on your Nostradamus hats today, and I'm gonna ask this panel each of these questions to be able to get your ideas about this. So Bob, we'll go to you first. Well, you know, like any banker is gonna say, it's gonna be cash flow. You know, cash is king. As, as you manage through the cycle, you've gotta be, be able to understand how you're going to be able to pay your employees and, and ultimately fund the project. So I, I, I would say is any, any cycle you go through, uh, when, when, when the, um, the opportunities don't present themselves, it's, it's trying to make sure you, you understand what it's going to take to perform the work, what, what is the cash implications behind it, and then ultimately where do you find more revenue? And, and so I think every contractor uh, is going to have to evaluate where do they want to stay? Do they want to stay in Illinois? Do they want to look regionally? Do they want to look nationally? Obviously, anytime you go outside of the core market that you're in, there's inherent risks that go along with that. But I think as we sort of look at Illinois, for example, you know, the, the, some fundamental issues are, are going to face our, our state uh, for the foreseeable future. So if you make your living just in Illinois, I think you really are missing out on opportunity. So, you know, Understanding how to manage risk, continuing to look at your cash flow is going to be important. What, what I love about the, the engineering and the construction uh, industry is it's sort of the uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I mean, you, you have people that are going to find opportunities. You know, as Justin had mentioned, I mean, they have been in the, in the forefront of the, of the modular building and, and trying to figure out how to control the labor component to be more cost effective. And so I think they're going to be firms like Skender and others that are going to come up with different ideas to figure out how to bring technology into an industry that really has not embraced technology as, as much as they should. Along these lines, and, and certainly we'll let Christian talk about the importance of being able to leverage technology from you know, work from home environment and, and making sure that you've got immediate access to data. Uh, you, you, you can't, uh, what you can't measure, you can't manage. So being able to get information timely and being able to do something with that information is critical. And, and I guess I would say it's irrespective of COVID, but certainly as it relates to a, a very challenging work environment where it's going to be much more difficult to get work, you really got to have all that at your disposal to, to uh, compete against some other very formidable uh, contractors, engineers, and, and people in the industry. 
so Bob, you, you sounded like a lawyer there about the measurements and metrics. So I, I really, that rings true in all of our industries, I think, and uh, with the overlay of the specialty in terms of construction, engineering, and architecture design. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a, a question here and, and turn to Chris on this, and specifically this technology embracing, and we'll come to Christian to sort of give us more thoughts about this in terms of the tactical side. But Chris, first, when we talk about projects, I mean, in some respects, construction and engineering have held themselves out as moving forward, whether they be BIM projects or otherwise, um, and moving into the cloud more quickly even than some other industries. What do you think about this in terms of the other side of this pandemic? What's construction and design going to look like? Well, as you said, Karen, uh, engineers and architects are the first ones um, in the flow uh, if we're not designing, there is no construction, there's no building, there's no home building or anything uh, along the line. So um, up to be, be six months ago, five months ago, uh, um, giving, making sure that every single person, whether she or he is a, a CAD operator or an engineer, a, 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 a laptop was uh, not very you know, common, only about 75% of the uh, staff. We had to completely uh, reorganize. And Karen, I don't know how many of our staff that have children, men or women, are going to be coming back to the office this fall and what their work schedule is going to be looking like. How are we going to have to accommodate their, uh, their uh, teaching, of their e-learning their e of their children? And so how we do it, what time of day we do it, um, who's doing it, all those things are in a state of flux. Um, we're seeing that... Uh, um, you know, things that we never really took, we took, never spent much time learning about whether it's Zoom, Teams, WebEx, uh, whatever form it is, are going to be crucial to our ability to get the uh, drawings, uh, the plans, um, the, uh, the work on the uh, uh, streets. So I think we're going to, we're embracing technology like never before. I know Christian's going to talk later on about some of the other threats that working at home present to uh, engineers and architects. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. So, so Christian, now our technology expert uh, on this panel, tell us what you think about in terms of these aspects and uh, indeed what you consider in terms of some of these concerns uh, post-COVID. Well, <clears throat> so there's, uh, there's quite a lot to unpack right there. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some things uh, from a technology perspective in, in general and uh, maybe tie it into a little bit about what we do in, in my classroom um, uh, for the EMDC and, and also talk specifically about some uh, technology solutions. Um, the problem is not, a, we do not have a supply problem from a technology perspective. We have more than enough software out there. Um, you could spend virtually all your revenues almost uh, chasing down different applications for tools, for trucking, for invoice routing, for human resources, for project management, BIM. I mean, it, the list goes on and on. Contractors have not changed their IT spending habits really at all in 20 some years. And so they're still sort of in a in a cost saving sort of mentality, at least that's been my perspective. And you know, how, what's the most we can get out of this solution and still spend the least amount of money? So, so supply is not the problem, adoption has been the problem. And you know, I have, Bob, you'll, you'll be, you'll, I, I use banking as an example all the time. And I talk about the fact that in a bank, when you go into the bank and you, you know, offer a check or, you know, have a transaction, that teller has zero discretion, correct? Zero discretion when it comes to how they're going to do that process. They can't do it this way sometimes and that way sometimes. And if I get an answer I don't like at one branch, I can't go to another branch, right? I mean, you guys are locked yeah. down in terms of process. And in construction, that's not how it is. <laughs> we invent our processes every time in a construction site. Now, that's a broad generalization. Some people might take exception, but we tend not to be as rigid. Sometimes the job site, the customer demands that we behave differently. But we've used that as an excuse in a lot of ways to stay on spreadsheets, to stay on man. I still run into manual pieces of paper and form, triplicate forms. I shouldn't be doing that in 2020. So 
again, we don't have a supply problem, we have an adoption problem. We also have, not only is it, not only do we have plenty of software, but we have plenty of different software from different vendors, and none of those solutions talk to each other. So when you go into the typical construction company today, you have probably 20 applications doing different things, and very few of them talk to each other. And every single piece of software that doesn't talk to another one needs human intervention to sit down at a keyboard and rekey data from one to the other. So you've got tremendous inefficiency there. One of the things, I was at a client office, I'll share a quick story. I was at a client office probably mid-year last year, a big, big uh, billion dollar specialty contractor. We were helping them with uh, some procurement strategy and so forth. Went to one of their main processing office and I walked in the door and on the counter was literally 500, 700 invoices in envelopes, in envelopes. So on last year, that was just grossly inefficient. Now it's impossible because the person who was opening up 700 envelopes and distributing them in colored folders isn't there. And so we've had to change processes that depended on manual paperwork quite a bit. One, one last thing I will say, I, th I know we're gonna to get to cyber threat in a minute. One of the things the construction industry has, has got to do is rethink the way they manage IT. When they started IT departments back in the day, it was all about infrastructure. And the, and the IT director was very proud of their data center. It had glass walls and it had racks, cooling, it had lights. I mean, it was brilliant, right? And, but that was all they knew how to do. And that whole infrastructure has gone out of the building into the cloud now. So they don't need all of those engineers anymore. They need people that can work with software, work with users, connect systems, uh, do a better job with uh, data analytics. So the IT staffing paradigm has got to change. And the, the, the level of threat that we have now from cybersecurity, which I know we'll talk about in a minute, has changed greatly. And as the, so the job of an IT director has not only shifted, but it's, it's come up a level. So, I mean, I think that there's plenty, plenty of opportunity in this industry for technology, which is why I'm excited to teach the course that I do at the EMDC is because we get into many of these issues in a very substantial way. Sorry, Karen, I went too long. No, Christian, that's okay. That's why I'm moderating. I'll cut you off when I want to. So, no, that was perfect, I think. Um, so, if we can advance to the next slide, we're going to go to um, the difficult topic in the, the construction industry to Justin about talking about construction economics. And really, notwithstanding all of the positives that Chris tried to give us in, in some of these thoughts, there really are measurements, right? So, in construction, time is money. And Bob talked to us about the uh, financial impacts on these projects. Justin, what do you think in terms of how the schedules and costs are being affected and you know, the value of lean project delivery and thorough pre-construction that your firm is specifically in terms of Skender and the fabrication entity focusing on? What can you share with us today? Well, from, from uh, start the backwards here. Um, now lean before was uh, optional. Now it is a necessity. This is necessity because things cannot be brought and just store it on a project and stack to the ceiling and move them around because you just, it's, it's cost, it's double handling with labor, which affects COVID. Um, and it just, it's not smart. And now you have to just be smarter because the numbers are tighter. Performers are tighter. Um, you gotta be better at what you gotta do. Um, from, from a schedule standpoint, it really depends on how COVID is handled. You know, we do a ton of interior build outs in the city of Chicago. It's about $300 million a year. And, a lot of those are occupied renovations of, of projects, of hospitals over Northwestern or, or you know, in the Sears Tower or I should say the Willis Tower. Um, you know, having those folks in your space, you need to make sure that the, the, the cleanliness and the pro process and protocol as far as checking temperatures, logging people in, and just general safety is taken care of and monitored every day uh, very closely. Schedules is a big one um, on projects specifically where you've got a bottleneck of transportation onto a site, typically vertical transportation. Maybe it's on a new high rise building with an outside hoist or a uh, renovation of an exi existing building. Um, we start early in the morning and before we would load 
three or 400 people up at the Willis Tower in the morning. And uh, now, you know, they'd start at 6 a.m. Now they start at 2 a.m., which affects, you know, people's overtime. It affects union rules. Um, it affects our own oversight, supervision, safety, and just more exposure. So um, it's interesting. Um, you really have to be on your toes to watch some of this stuff. Thank you, Justin. I, I think that's very true. And, and if we can advance to the next slide, um, the panel has put together a, a whole host of sort of these questions that exist right now and additional concerns that are facing the industry. Um, many of them that they did, um, not only with uh, the project teams that Justin just referred refer to and he's queuing up for four hours to be able to get into project sites and the safety and things related to it, um, but these additional concerns. And, and we can tick and tie each one of these. I, I wanted to open it up to um, each of the panelists to see if there's anything else to true up this topic and these additional concerns that you wanted to mention and share with this group as takeaways. So Justin, we'll just start with you. You know, I would, uh, as, as a construction company general contractor, and, you know, there's always, we have obviously project managers, and we've got a, a field force of superintendents. Um, the work from home, you know, it's, you still have to get to project sites, and it's starting to create a, a larger divide between field and office, which there's already a divide to begin with. Um, if you're not careful, you don't help really purposely integrate those folks day in and day out. Um, they don't see each other. They don't spend enough time together. Um, you know, and it, it, it's a challenge. Um, you know, the procurement side too is right now you can find out even the simplest of, of materials um, can be a long lead item. So you just can't assume anything is right off the shelf like it was before. Um, and then you have to look at just the chain of control. Uh, make sure that everything is clean coming in and it's COVID free and, and handled correctly. So Bob, in, in a world of already a very regulated federal um, uh, industry in terms of compliance and some of these additional concerns. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with the group today about the takeaways on these concerns? It's, it's all going to be about the, the workforce safety. So we, we all are going to try to figure out how we can get either projects, financing, everything done in a way that gives the same amount of due diligence while safely making sure our employees can operate. So it, it really aligns with what, what the other uh, presenters have discussed. So Chris, on these topics, is there anything you want to take away before I get to my favorite next topic, which is the question about what's keeping you all up at night? So anything else you want to share with this, Chris? Um, the only thing I would say is, Karen, uh, attorneys have always told us as uh, engineers not to be responsible for job site safety. Ironically, at the beginning, as engineers and uh, contractors were deemed to be essential workers and were allowed to work even though the rest of the uh, people that were at home feeling miserable, um, time and time again, we were challenged with really um, inserting ourselves in the process to make sure the contractors wore masks and uh, separated and didn't do the things that they were used to doing, the uh, workers is what I'm referring to. And I, we had to insert ourselves in a very forceful way because we knew our municipal clients were getting calls from people that were home being miserable and they wanted everybody to be miserable and didn't think it was fair. So this was an interesting role at the beginning of the uh, process. And finally, being able to adapt. I walked down for uh, before this uh, um, event started today and a young man was participating in a Toastmasters event with other people that are in the building, um, but all they were giving speeches, but from their desks individually, rather collectively, um, but while everybody watched uh, carefully. And uh, so they already have uh, changed and adapted to this new uh, world. And Chris, I think you bring up an excellent comment because it, it isn't just the lawyers suggesting to the engineers and designers not take means and methods. It's the lawyers telling the general contractors don't take over means and methods of your subcontractors or those sub-subs, right? Um, so we're trying to exculpate all of our clients out of liability. But the problem is in this world and when you're facing global health crisis, the concern under OSHA and the ever-changing standards in terms of what constitutes wanton and willful misconduct if you're observing uh, those on a job site who are not engaging in appropriate social distancing in a safe workplace, that liability, et cetera, is still very unsettled. So it, it's not only in your own workplaces that we have to be concerned about it, it's what's happening 
um, but more uh, in terms of each of our project sites. Uh, so Christian, is there anything else that you'd like to add on this topic before we turn to uh, what's keeping you all up at night? Yeah, Karen, um, there actually is, and I, I think it ties in nicely with what you and Chris were just mentioning. You know, on this slide here, I, I mentioned HR and safety, and, um, you know, HR, used human resources as a department, as a support service to a construction firm, used to lag. I mean, it was, it was a part-time payroll administrator, and it kind of was in the same boat as IT. It was an overhead item. It was necessary. It wasn't seen as strategic. Today, 100% strategic. It's you've got uh, recruiting and onboarding you've got to do. You've got training and development. You've got compliance worries. So the HR position is elevated. And along with that, we've seen the automation of that um, uh, function go quite a, quite a long ways. And so people are, are uh, coming to us a lot now for uh, selecting and implementing larger scale uh, professional grade HR solutions. And, and that ties in with the safety. We've got much better systems now for tracking job site safety, incidents and accidents, OSHA 300, all the things that have to be done uh, around that administration, as well as training administration. We're seeing a lot more emphasis now on, on the automation of the training function and putting in what are called learning management systems so that you can have online learning around safety, around production, around um, uh, materials management, whatever it happens to be. Um, we're also, I mean, just as, a, as an example, something we look at in class is um, there are systems now that are using uh, a little bit of uh, uh, robotic, a little bit of, of um, uh, what's called AI uh, to monitor job site safety. So Karen, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but there's actually cameras that are out there looking at job site and, and, and doing video monitoring. And if they see some, if the camera sees somebody without a, a mask or a hard hat or fall protection, it'll see that, it'll flag it, and it'll notify the project manager, the safety director. So I think that we've got systems out, now, out there now that are much more uh, proactive about job site safety. Thank you, Christian. And, and um, again, on the legal side here, it's a dramatic sea changed shift, right? We were talking about all of the biometric data that was available to check for employees and, and unions were against having on vests to be able to see if you had elevated um, temperatures or heart rates, et cetera. Now, we're not hearing unions talking about that because we are in a pandemic. So, so this technology is changing dramatically. So thank mm -hmm. you, Christian, for bringing that up. I think it's important to see that all of those bargaining um, positions are, are very fluid now in this situation. So now I'm going to get to the topic that I can't wait to hear from each one of you, and we'll move on to the next slide. And um, I, I think this is true. We've come to, I think it could be even a drinking game if one were interested in doing these sorts of things. But try to open an app or listen to the news and not hear someone say we're living in uncertain times. It, it won't happen. We tick and tie it every time we hear it. So in these uncertain times, since I'm going to pose it to each of you, and we'll start with Bob, what are the most important concerns in the AEC industry that are keeping you up nights running the bank? Well, it, it, it really is about the health and safety of our people, as I mentioned earlier. I mean, we, we're facing something that none of us, uh, or at least most of us, have not faced. I mean, certainly there are people that were, were, involved, were uh, familiar with the polio ec epidemic, but, but certainly not the scarlet fever, smallpox, et cetera. And so, you know, what we're facing with COVID is something we've not seen before. And, you know, I think it's going to be incumbent upon all of us to acknowledge that it's real. And until we as a society and, and certainly within our country uh, address what's happening, I don't know how we can ultimately get back to what we want to do as far as business as usual. Uh, what what this, the, the infection rate of this um, disease is such that you know, 70% of us at some point in time are going to get it. And so how do we flatten the curve and ultimately figure out how we all can feel comfortable about getting to the next phase? So, you know, if I look at most important, this is real. We got to take proactive measures and we have to be patient. Um, the, the, the second element is, you know, the cybersecurity. And I'm not going to steal the thunder of Christian, but, you know, if you ask me what keeps me up at night, uh, in addition to waiting for my four daughters to get home, teenage daughters, I might add, um, it, it really is about how dependent we are on the internet. 
And in the events of any type of catastrophe, intended or unintended, how do we perform our jobs? Uh, so that that really is something that um, is something we got to continue to make sure we put layers of defense. There, there is no silver bullet. It is all about putting in layers of defense, very much like what we're doing with the COVID as far as protective measures and social distancing, et cetera. I'd say the final one and the long-term implications is, is fiscal discipline. I think the Fed has done a terrific job in creating liquidity and being able to sort of prime the pump, so to speak. Uh, but, but the implications, the long-term implications of that is that we will not see very significant growth in the economy because the, the debt that we are incurring is, is gonna obviously inhibit our ability to grow uh, because we're gonna have to obviously pay a, a certain portion of our, um, our taxes towards debt service. And as we're, we're certainly experiencing in the state of Illinois, you know, you start seeing a rise in interest rates, um, you, you have a significant impact. And so I would say that we really have got to make sure we look at uh, the, the fiscal discipline within our states, within our businesses, and within our countries. So in conclusion, it's certainly health and safety. It, it really is about making sure uh, that we are um, taking this, this seriously and in finding ways um, that we have the ability to um, do things in a, in a fiscally responsible uh, manner. Well, Bob, thank you for sharing those. Um, I will say, however, having once been a teenage daughter and having one uh, that now is thankfully through those phrases, I think having four of them is much more of a nightmare. They would keep me up much more at night than any of the things you just outlined. I used to have I hair. <laughs> Mine used to be brown. Um, so we'll go next to uh, Chris. Can you tell us, Chris, in terms of your business industry, I think you teed some of this up in terms of um, working in uh, you know, Illinois as well as Indiana, but what's keeping you up nights running your design firm? Karen, when you uh, asked this question, I had to think about uh, what has kept me up over the last three months. And uh, um, we got together as a presence of the different companies and all went, we went around the room and discussed how many years of our life have been taken off of the end point as a result of this uh, last three months. I gotta tell, and Bob, don't get mad, most of it's been driven by uh, bankers. Um, and the, uh, um, uh, I've, I've heard more about portals uh, that I- uh, um, uh, The bankers are always at fault. Yeah, well, let's blame you. So, so anyway, so that was what uh, uh, really uh, scarred us. So as we look forward, Karen, one of the things is what else can happen? What else? Um, uh, about a month ago when things were just looking good, we had a micro burst and a third of the roof of our nine story office building flew off and uh, got its, uh, was on Higgins Road. So after having uh, to evacuate people from the building, you know, there's not, probably not much else that we can see, but I think there are, are, are going to be a lot of uh, headwinds. We talked about the headlines in the uh, Wall Street Journal on Tuesday saying businesses are gearing up for a long road to a rebound. And I think that's really um, what we're going to see. We're going to see uh, uh, Washington come out with something in the next 10 days, two weeks. What is that going to help? Is it going to hurt? Um, how will we uh, deal with it? So um, I, uh, uh, we, you know, what, what's around the corner is keep the thought of uh, bad things to come is uh, certainly not keeping me uh, um, in a peaceful sleep. Let's say that. Well, thank you, Chris. And, and also, I appreciate um, us uh, taking it all out on Bob today because it's usually damn the lawyers. So we're solving all the industry's problems right now. So, you know, I'll take credit for that, too. Um, Christian, why don't we go to the next slide? You can tell us about some of the technology nightmares that I know are keeping you up at night. Well, we've talked a little bit about the, the, the issue of adoption. And um, I, I think that the... Um, the cyber threat is something that we are hearing uh, across the board. That, and I think Karen, you're going to touch on that in in a couple of minutes. So I'll, I'll leave that uh, topic alone. I still feel like you know owners owners out there feel like there's somewhere between well probably 15 to 20 percent of their cost they feel like is in waste 
in our industry. Mega projects are consistently over budget, over schedule. And so these are some of the macro issues that our industry is dealing with. COVID didn't help, didn't hurt, it just is it's just one more complexity. We have got a lot to solve for in this industry. And um, so I think that as a, as president of this firm and, and leading a team that helps construction firms with these issues, I, I think that's what causes me more angst is why is that, what are the, what are the conditions that, that keep this industry back? And why do we not move more productively to solve problems? And I think, as you probably know, Karen, there are some systemic issues here, the way that we're all broken apart into so many firms and the, the contractual nature of relationships. You know, I would be, I would be optimistic uh, if I saw more IPD, just as an example, you know, um, things that, so we work together and maybe, maybe this situation with COVID is actually going to force us to be a little bit more collaborative, a little more cooperative, less combative, and work together on things. And I realize that's not on technology, but I just, uh, I, I want to see the industry. I want to leave the industry in a better place <laughs> than when I got here. Well, Justin, I think that's a nice segue to you because um, do you believe that COVID has put us into a more collaborative uh, state? And do you think that, I, I know you want to not only leave the industry better, but our infrastructure and everything else better because you want to build it and make it better. Um, so what do you think about this, Justin? What's keeping you and the folks on the executive team at Skender up at night? Well, the first thing for us is just everybody's safety in general, uh, specifically our folks. Um, our project teams, and that's extended project teams, consultants, and everybody, and our clients, and their 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 teams' well-being. So, um, you're not being complacent as things as we sputter along with, you know, new COVID cases and open things opening up, things shutting down. We're going to have some bump. We're going to bump around here for the next probably six to twelve months with some awkward times. So, just keeping our head down, being very disciplined in that aspect. You know, the big thing for us is being the best partner we can be um, internally with our own employees and team and uh, our clients and understanding what their needs is going to be. What you know, like, how has the cheese moved and skate to where the puck is going to be um, as far as, you know, how people are going to work. Are they all going back to the office? Are they, you know, like, are they going to need some less space, more space? How are healthcare providers going to interact with their customers? Are we going to go back to more regional based hospitals, more brick and mortar hospitals as opposed to mega hospitals? Um, and then where are people going to ultimately live? I think that's going to shuffle around over the next two or three years. I think you're going to see some folks move out of the metropolitan areas and spread out to the suburbs or even farther. Um, and we're looking at things more regionally and, and uh, how we can be more effective and just be a good, good partner to our clients and continue to service them as best we can and be get to that end result quicker and short cycle some of that learning curve. Well, thank you. I mean, I, it grounds us very much, I think, in all of our companies, and I'm sure that all the participants believe this as well in terms of the safety of the workforce. Um, so I'm going to move to a, a third topic that we wanted to cover with the panel today um, that uh, Jason has now segued us into. Um, and, you know, Justin talked about the importance of some of these items in safety. I want to go back to uh, Bob first and uh, then to uh, Chris and Christian to ask about technology and some cyber risks. And I'll just tee up here a plug for the EMDC program. This is one of the topics on which I teach in terms of uh, not only cyber risks, but also crisis management and uh, ethics issues that arise very much out of the use of technology. Uh, and I think it's a, a critical topic for our executives and all of our industry professionals to understand. So Bob, I'm going to go to you this first. And um, we've talked a, a great deal today about some of the, the PPI and other confidential information and in your regulated industry. Talk about some of those enterprise risks, um, specifically in the AEC side and best practices and trends that you are implementing at the bank to manage them. I think that one of the biggest concerns is what what access to the internet people are using. I mean, we, we can control uh, within sort of our, our own businesses access and, and put 
different uh, types of layers of protection, uh, making sure people aren't coming in and emulating or making sure we've got someone that can approve something, but, but ultimately uh, then ultimately execute. So you've got dual authentication. Where, where we get most concern is that when people are using their personal computers going on to uh, our, our websites or they are accessing information or their children, you know, our daughters, I'm sure there are plenty of websites that ultimately can inf um, affect our, our technology and, and compromise the layers of protection uh, that we put in place. So it, it's back to this layers of defense. We, we can put all the technology in place, but if the users don't embrace it, uh, we really are at a problem. And, and I think that the banking industry in particular, because it's the movement of funds. Uh, we've had many construction draws where actually someone had emulated into the one of our clients' computers. They knew, they knew that they wanted a construction draw, that they were contacting the title company. And they ultimately, these perpetrators went in, sent a, a draw request to the title company, and they said that their banking account had changed. They have gone to another financial institution and lo and behold, that construction draw went somewhere else. So there, there is just so much that is going on that we take for granted that it, we have to step back and make sure, does it make sense? And the whole notion of you can't do everything virtually, pick up the phone and ask if it doesn't make sense. So I think we have to use common sense, we have to use technology, but we really have to rely on our users to follow protocol. And to Christian's point before, uh, I, I think there, there are many ways that you try to ring fence it, but the fact of the matter is we have really uh, talented individuals that, that ultimately want to have a little autonomy in what they do, and they can't all have everything dictated to them, but, but really understanding the inherent risk and what we do each and every day as a result of using the web is absolutely critical. And Bob, I think that's an excellent point. I'm going to turn to Chris to ask this in terms of um, your work with your firm on this. But clearly, I mean, we've had statutes that um, the law is just like it was with the advent of the internet. Copyright law didn't catch up quickly enough. Now we have statutes all across the country saying you can't send certain information and, and PPI through electronic means, and yet everybody's working remotely. So how are we doing that, and how is the law going to, you know, in these statutes going to catch up? Um, so Chris, uh, in terms of these additional enterprise risks um, related to cyber threats, uh, what can you share with us today? Well, right before we sent people home, Karen, we uh, were starting to hear from maybe 30 to 40 percent of our competitors that they had uh, been uh, held up for, in some cases, uh, uh, you know, seven figures um, uh, ransomware and uh, shutting down their entire operation. So uh, we were already, thankfully, in putting things in place. But throughout the uh, uh, last uh, uh, year or so, we've been seeing a increase in the number of people that are sending emails to change the routing for different payroll, um, individuals' payrolls, uh, invoicing, um, uh, clients saying, send the uh, you know, not clients, uh, fake clients, asking for uh, uh, invoices, uh, checks for uh, payments for invoices to be sent to a different uh, location. So I think the uh, people that are uh, um, uh, predisposed to do this are working overtime and taking advantage of the uh, bifurcation now that takes place with uh, um, people working through um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of locations. So it's a real threat. People like Christian should be taking advantage of this because it's uh, uh, something that everybody in our industry is very susceptible to. That's a great point, Chris. I hadn't thought of that. Well, are you taking advantage of it, Chris, or what are you teaching everyone, not just in your course at the EMDC program, but to all your clients? Well, <clears throat> so cyber threat has been around for quite some time, and I would say it was, it was one of the agenda items on your typical CIO's desk, <laughs> um, among many others. And, uh, but it is clearly elevated to the top. And I mean, the board of directors of big firms now are asking a lot harder questions. You know, there's a, there's a bullet point on here about, um, well, I think that firms take an internal view of cybersecurity and they do what they can. That's not enough. Companies 
Um, uh, there are companies out there that will do penetration testing and other uh, audit of security. And they need a, in fact, to get proper um, cyber insurance, Karen, I think they need to have a letter saying that they've been through a cyber audit uh, just to make sure that, that it's been sufficient. And I mean, really large and publicly traded companies are actually, they're assigning a security officer, somebody whose sole job is protecting digital assets and, and the welfare of the company. Um, so a lot more is being done. I want to point something out um, that relates to this topic. Um, you know, a lot of folks, and I don't know where everybody is in the spectrum of, of how they know about how much they know about this cyber threat, but a lot of people imagine that there's a guy with a hood in in an Eastern European country tapping away at a at a keyboard trying to break into a network. That's the common sort of perception, and that's not how a lot of it happens. It's it's phishing expeditions. It's um, it's spam and malware it's people clicking on the wrong thing so you see this bullet in the middle is sitting there rather innocuous social engineering that is exactly the predominance of the problem it's when when i send an email to bob's company which says oh hey i forgot my password could you send it to me but it looks like bob's email except it's one letter off and so the person replies back and boom i'm in the bank now i know that doesn't happen at a bank but that's what's going on. So there's a company out there, and I'm, I'm, this is not a, I'm not associated with them, but so I don't mind mentioning their name, but there's a company out there that their whole reason, their whole mission is to raise awareness inside of companies around cyber threat. It's, it isn't good enough that the CIO understands the threat. Every worker that's on a keyboard has to understand the threat, has to know what to look for. You've got to have people that are like aware that there's malware coming through and what to be looking for. In this company, it's called No B4. They actually train workers on that and they check how many clicks you get on bad email in the very beginning. Then they run training exercises over weeks and months and then they test again to see What's the level of, of uh, participation after all that training? And it goes down dramatically. So I think that it's, it's, you really have to focus on, it's not, I mean, the network has to be protected for sure, but your workers are a big part of your vulnerability. So on that point, Justin, I'm going to turn it to you because as many of us probably know, one of the first and major of these retail breaches was the target one of uh, financial data of customers and clients. That all started, as we know, from a mechanical subcontractor and the infiltration of their system ultimately through working at um, the locations. So Justin, in terms of working with your subs and others and the information that you've got to be concerned about when so many more systems and controls are all being done by instrumentation every worker has some handheld device, whether it's their phone or their computer that they're doing everything from engineering opinions to texting back and forth to be able to get information about a project and doing daily logs. What are you doing and what do you think that the industry needs to be aware of from the construction contractor side in terms of cyber risks? So a little history, we've gotten a, a hard lesson in over the last 18 months of all of these events. We were held hostage, if you will, um, our entire IT system for about a week for over seven figures, um, which was an interesting procedure and process, which I've never been through. And then we've also, I mean, it seems like almost a couple times a week, we have some type of request that comes in for payment that is off by a few, you know, routing numbers or account numbers or both. I, Bob had mentioned um, it happens weekly now. And really the, the big thing for everybody, it, it's training and hyper vigilance at the front lines, which is people that are processing this. And it means testing, retesting, going through situations, just like Christian mentioned, having an outside firm, try to poke holes through the gate, through the fence, if you will, and then looking at the information, reviewing it with your team, saying, where can we be better? And also, to Bob's point, picking up the phone. Hey, did you just send me this request for pay request? Because this, this looks a little bit odd to me. Looks something like your letterhead, but it might be a little bit off, a little manufactured. It's just kind of being smart. And just, you know, just because the computer says it is so, pick up a phone. And um, I hate to say it, you know, there's no, there's no 
that you need to have a relationship with people on the line and be able to pick up the phone and you just ask me, you might think it's a dumb question. It's not. Did you just send me a pay request to this odd number? And a lot of times you'll find out no. So it's getting through some human behavior things, like you're not just relying on technology all the time. It's definitely true, Justin. And I think that much of my day now in my consulting company spends time looking at enterprise risks and going in and analyzing the insurance policies to see if there's gaps between the crime fraud and the cyber risks and what you're getting from your subs and the like. So uh, this is an ever-present interest rate and it's continuing to evolve and, and COVID I think has accelerated it. So thank you for those comments. Um, I'm now going to turn in uh, the last uh, five or so minutes that we have. We want to get the panel's views before we open it up for questions um, in terms of financial trends in the construction industry. Um, so if we can advance to that slide. And what I'd like to go to Bob first, and I think this is appropriate to land in your hand, um, is in terms of the current banking trends. You talked a little bit about those at the opening of the program. And uh, some of these trends um, that financial concerns that are impacting the industry and how they're changing the way money is exchanged in our industry. And I think Christian's got some points on that too. So Bob, I'll turn it over to you first. I, I think that the technology and, and Christian can talk about some of the, the um, companies out there that are trying to make it easier to pay and process. It's, it's all about reconciliation. How can I get my bills uh, put together, compiled effectively to get out to the owner to then ultimately get paid. And then how do I make sure I have all of my costs from labor and AP as far as supplies processed to the home office as quickly as possible? Again, back to this, this ability to manage with, with information at your disposal. So there's a lot of discussion regarding blockchain. There's a lot of discussion around cryptocurrencies and the means by which we can uh, transact. I, I think the, the challenge we have right now is that um, right now that the, the controls and getting something back should you do something in error does not exist. And so I think that there is some wonderful technology that is available at a certain point in time when we can get the right control functions, which effectively what the Federal Reserve and the banking system provides. And, and some of the things that are being proposed relative to the cryptocurrency really takes some of the banking and, and the, the banking uh, regulators out of the, uh, the equation, uh, which I appreciate everyone wants to get the banks out of the equation as they want to get the, the attorneys out. But certainly if you want to get your money back, uh, you, I'll tell you, we're the first people that are being called. So uh, reconciliation is really top of mind right now. The ability to make sure you're reconciling your receivables and, and knowing when you are able to collect what you're being able to do with your underbillings and get it converted to receivables, uh, and then certainly on your payables. And, and I guess I would defer more now to Christian relative to some of the things in Textura and, and the Abbott Exchange and, and others that I think a number of contractors have effectively utilized to improve their back office. So Karen, you want me to take it from there? Please do, Christian. So, um, Bob, thank you for that. Um, so let me make one quick distinction too, and I really appreciate the way you said that. Um, a lot of people today, and I hear it really quite regularly, to sort of think of blockchain and cryptocurrency as the same thing. And, and uh, cryptocurrency uh, is actually built on blockchain, but blockchain has a number of other purposes. And I think the, the notion of smart contracts, where we're, where we're going to be able to have a contract a, a virtual contract, if you will, between a general contractor and a subcontractor. And as payment, as performance is completed and checked off, then payment is made. And when you think about that, that's very much of the way Textura and GC Pay work. You have a, you have a ledger, a contract, if you will, in the cloud, and there's uh, various amounts of money to be paid. And a subcontractor applies for payment on that cloud application. It's approved by the general contractor. That rolls up to the owner. The owner approves it. Then that we collect our lien waivers, which I know Karen's very passionate about, I'm sure. And then, um, uh, then when all of that is set and done, the owner can release funds to Textura, who then releases it from the general to the sub. So the pay there is a tremendous amount of payment processing being done through Textura 
less so GC pay, but only because they're a smaller company. So that kind of automated uh, cash distribution is really liked by owners, by title companies, um, and probably by the legal community as well, because it makes sure that all the documentation is handled correctly and well before funds are distributed. Um, so I think that that's an int it's interesting that Textura sort of got there before um, we had blockchain, but I think that blockchain is going to probably be the next extension of that. The other area where I would say it's been interesting from a, from a, uh, a procurement standpoint has been with solutions like Ariba and, and uh, Coupa and uh, to a lesser extent, maybe Command Alcon. Now we've got solutions where you can order uh, supplies, construction material, what have you. And uh, when you place the order, the receiving company, the vendor, it acknowledges that order in their system that acknowledgement comes back and says, hey, we got your order, it'll be there on Tuesday. Then when it's delivered, somebody with a handheld device is at the job site, they check it in and say, yeah, I got it. An invoice is generated, then a payment's generated. So the whole transaction is sort of in between two vendor, two companies. And I think it streamlines tremendously the, um, the payment process. So there are technologies that are being applied to the procure to pay function. And I think that's particularly um, helpful. And the last point I want to make on, on this tech front is that um, one of the tremendous legal issues, Karen, that I'm sure you face quite frequently is when you go into a claim situation, if you deal with those from time to time, and, and you're asking for documentation, right? all the paperwork, the contracts, the, all the paperwork, and, and it's a paper chase. You have to go digging through people's email, you have to be looking in boxes, you have to find out well, where did it get sent, where's that document stored. Construction companies have not had suitable document management in their organizations. And so they face tremendous risk when they're under, when they're under pressure from a claim, a suit, discovery, what have you, because it, it's very costly to retrieve all that. And so we are seeing uh, content management technology being deployed in the industry and is much better at retrieving important documentation that the lawyers are asking for. So those are some of the things we're seeing from a risk mitigation standpoint. So Christian, yes, um, I've put uh, one son so far through Northwestern, another daughter through U Chicago, and, and the youngest is a rising sophomore at Northwestern, um, dealing with claims in construction, including force majeure and a number of other things. And, and with COVID-related claims and the exculpatory language in many contracts, um, the number of those are coming up. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, Chris, I wanted to go back to you just for a minute in terms of trends, and then I've got a number of questions that I've received that I wanted to address to the panel about some of those things. So in terms of the trends of the industry, we have um, one of the slides up that the panel put together in terms of the construction schedule in months um, that we see in terms of speed to market. Um, we've also talked a, a great deal about, um, if you can advance the slide, um, in terms of skilled labor and the contractors and, and changes in the labor industry. Chris, I'd like to turn to you and, and say, sort of close up this topic on financials um, in terms of your view about what we see going forward in the future in the construction industry. Well, I've already beaten up uh, the uh, banking and, um, business and uh, I, I mean, my uh, uh, hopes are that, uh, and, and not because they're benevolent, but because I have to, mortgage rates stay low so that uh, um, whether it's uh, industrial uh, or residential uh, uh, access to cash is available so that we can move forward and get these uh, projects um, uh, you know, implemented uh, faster. I think if you look at the last recession, that was not available. That was a constraint, probably rightfully so, and that uh, um, caused us to uh, uh, spiral out of control. So hopefully the um, banks provide access uh, to cash and uh, don't start uh, holding it back as we move uh, forward in the next couple months and year. Thank you, Chris. Um, one of the questions I had, Justin, I'm gonna to go to you on this in terms of the uh, contractors presenting access to skilled labor and some of the issues that we have is um, particularly interesting to me and of concern because I've spent um, you know three plus decades in this industry of construction engineering. And uh, it's one in which we still have underrepresentation of women 
and uh, diverse candidates. So for construction companies, and now in this time where we're using technology more fully, and instead of the welding golding arms that always had to be um, predominantly and were um, male employees, we now can bring many more women into this profession. Um, and I think all of you have been very instrumental in your industries and in your particular firms um, to do so. But I wondered, um, in terms of the question, uh, what is Skender and other firms that you see who are on the leading edge of this doing to bring in and advance more women through programs like the EMDC or otherwise that you're encouraging? Yeah, so what we, it starts with uh, you know identifying talent early. Um, specifically for us, it's opening and broadening, broadening our, our, our exposure to different universities, not maybe just the traditional ones we're all used to in different programs. Um, and, and bringing people up and mentoring them through um, our firm um, to make sure that everybody gets an adequate, sh adequate shot at success and future leadership and uh, just continue to mentoring people and giving everybody a shot at potentially being a partner at Skender, um, an equity partner. And, um, you know, just holding everybody to the same standard and the highest standard possible. Thank you, Justin. I think that's true um, and critical. The law has been slow to adapt to that, and we're working very, very hard to make those um, opportunities advantageous. And I would say that this degree program itself, um, getting a master's in the EMDC field uh, from Northwestern, is one of the best practices that I can recommend to folks on this to be able to accelerate their careers um, up to the C-suite. Um, so another question that I got, and I'll open it up to the panel, whomever would like to take this one, is that in this um, age of virtual work, how is it that you are resolving disputes? So whether it be a force majeure claim that is submitted um, and you have uh, timing issues to be able to resolve claims, are you going forward doing these in an alternative dispute resolution process, or are you trying to do that through some other form of using technology? Um, I'll open that up to the panel and ask anybody to be able to opine. So everybody on this panel doesn't need to resolve disputes because you don't have any. So I will answer it um, because the question came in and I'm sure that one of the participants ha has a burning issue on this. Um, I'm currently on the American Arbitration Association board and I'm a licensed uh, arbitrator and mediator in uh, the mega construction case panel, as well as commercial and, and um, the construction industry and joint ventures and M&A. And what we're seeing is that on um, all of my cases, we're going forward with mediations virtually. And there's no reason why you can't have a business session. We have the opportunity, just like you did today when you joined this meeting, with waiting rooms. Um, so we're doing that. We have separate rooms so we can talk one-on-one -on -one with the um, different clients or the participants. Uh, it gets a little bit more cumbersome when we have a uh, mediation of uh, multiple parties to do so, but we're still going forward with it. And it has been um, just as effective and I think some ways more so than even the in-person because sometimes those um, take longer to get to the point. Uh, everybody on these virtual hearings seems to be moving forward. Now the longer hearings and court um, in particular. Uh, as you all know, anybody in a dispute right now, the uh, federal and state courts are still not open um, other than to have uh, virtual hearings. Some of the different administrative hearings and groups are making access available, but it is not consistent across the country. So this is a big issue in terms of getting your disputes resolved, particularly when we talk about the cash flow matters that um, I think Bob brought up in the beginning. Uh, so that's very important. Um, so we have another question um, that came in in terms of artificial intelligence, and, and maybe Christian, this is a natural one to you, but I'll ask you to briefly address this and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Ray to sort of sum up the program and uh, talk about these things. So the question is basically, um, with all of the input and transition from artificial intelligence and the former construction document production, um, how can you see this being maintained, and what issues do you have and concerns about electronically stored information in the construction, CAD, and other world? Ooh, that, <laughs> there's quite a bit in that that question. A great question. <laughs> Indeed, and I'm I'm not sure if I'm going to hit it exactly right, but um, we are seeing AI being deployed now, and I'm actually doing I'm trying to stay current on on the reading on 
on uh, the developments of AI and how it's being applied and uh, where it's going and, and what are the underlying philosophical con considerations. Um, the, I think it has tremendous uh, potential to um, automate and speed some of the things that we are do today manually. I can think of, I mean, no one likes to read a 200 page spec book and look for all the submittal requirements. You could train a, a bot, what's called a bot, to read through and, and, and identify all of the submittal requirements as an example. But I think as you probably can appreciate and maybe Chris can as well and Justin, is we don't really want a, a bot or an AI application to read a set of drawings or read a spec and identify, maybe they can identify engineering problems like there's a tolerance that's not right or a measurement that's off. So there is some of that, but we don't wanna rely on that solely. I mean, we cannot remove, at least now, I, I don't think the, the level of human um, uh, judgment in, uh, and, and uh, experience because we're just not there and no one wants the liability that would come along with that. So uh, I think that we will see over time uh, technology being deployed to, to remove manual, very rote kind of tasks and uh, functions. Um, but I don't know, I don't know when we are going to be at the point where a, a bot or an application might recommend a, uh, a different construction material as an example in place of something else that was specified simply because it you know has all that experience although we certainly have a lot of data in this industry that uh, that, that a bot would learn from so it's it, it's fascinating it's fascinating stuff Karen but I tell you the the thing you can talk about what keeps you up at night we're not solving that problem today we're still solving electronic time cards and invoice routing. So I I don't want to start. <laughs> I think you already did. Uh, Chris, did you want to add anything on that? Because you are at the forefront of, of design innovation. No, I, th I agree with Christian. I think we're a little bit, uh, um, that may be a little bit too uh, uh, far advanced for traditional civil engineering, whether it's vertical or horizontal construction at this point. And so, Justin, with Skender Fabrication and all the work you're doing um, in terms of deploying technology in your work, is there anything else you wanted to add in response to that question? Um, not particularly, not to the, the AI, other than, you know, it, the, the manufacturing component of modular construction and pre-manufactured, um, pre-assembled components is completely different from a technology standpoint than it is from a construction AEC standpoint. And the big gap is having those two components communicate to each other. And um, the approach we, we, we take to a project traditionally is we wait the last responsible moment to design something, to select something, to design, engineer something. And manufacturing wise, uh, you do it the exact opposite. And you do it as soon as you can. Um, and then, you know, the, to, to Bob's standpoint, you know, the financial curve is complete opposite. It's completely front-loaded as opposed to back-loaded. So there's a lot of education. And when you really start to get through and start to build these projects from a modular construction standpoint, you start to shake out the real opportunities and some of the big, big glaring um, gaps that need to be overcame. So it's, uh, it's interesting. It really will focus some of the, the industry shortcomings very quickly. Um, I think it's definitely humble. COVID it's, has done that uh, as his climate change and a whole host of these other issues are really showing a lot of our warts, but it's also, as any SWOT analysis goes, we, we have tremendous opportunities, I think, out of um, this current pandemic to be able to improve our system and to really continue to be industry leaders. Um, so I, I'm going to ask to go to the next slide and thank all of our panel again. I think that, um, of course, every time I talk to these gentlemen, I come away, I think, smarter and more informed. And I really personally appreciate all of you giving your time so generously for the EMDC program uh, and Northwestern and educating all of uh, uh, the participants. So for all of you, um, for those of you who want additional information on the EMDC program um, and or if you want to start your application this afternoon, uh, there's still time. Um, the website link is here. And um, you can also, uh, if you go to the next slide and take a screenshot of this, you will be able to follow us 
and connect on our uh, various social media opportunities to be able to um, join. So please advance to the next slide so folks can have that. Um, and so what I'm gonna say is on behalf of uh, the panel and myself, um, we not only very much appreciate your time, but all of the participants' leadership in the AEC industry. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Professor Krizik to close, but um, personally on behalf of the panel, we tell all of you stay safe and be well, and thank you for your time today. So Ray, for you thank to close. Thank you very much, Karen. And thank, uh, thank you one and all the participants for joining with us today, and we look forward to welcoming you to future sessions that will be organized along this, this uh, same line. Actually, in the meantime, if you have any questions about the EMDC program, the slide was up there a moment. Don't hesitate to call uh, or call or email uh, me or any one, any one of the uh, adjunct faculty that you might know in the program. When I actually close, when this, this event was being organized, I was, had high expectations, knowing Karen's standards in particular. Uh, but what I saw exceeded the expectations I had. And I can only thank all of you, the stars of the show, for, uh, for an excellent uh, presentation, and in particular, the North Star, I guess, Karen, for putting it all together and, and moderating as she did. So uh, thank you all very, very much.